G'day, and welcome, or welcome back, to episode 10 of Whether or Not. This is Hurricane Milton, part two, the follow-up post-landfall. We're going to have a little bit more of a look at the data that was coming out of the official centres, not the really boring stuff, but we're just going to compare what... um, what we were hearing versus what was happening versus what mainstream was saying, you know, all that. So let's not muck around. We're going to get stuck straight in. So Milton hit landfall Wednesday the 9th of October. It seems that uh, the landfall was somewhere around the, uh, it was at Tampa, Mm -hmm. specifically Siesta Key. It seems to be the ground zero of landfall So that's being reported. And uh, it seems that the worst flooding hit a place called Plant City, which is a little bit east of Tampa. That's pretty much right in the middle there of that handle of the pan. On the lead up, there was reports of Category 3 storms, uh, which we will look into all that. But this was what the mainstream was telling us, Category 3. Hurricane Milton made landfall as a Category 3 storm. Says it there quite plainly. Yep, after Hurricane made landfall as a Category 3 storm. There it is. So we're going to scrutinise and have a look and see if we were being told the facts. And I'm going to let you take it from here, Jeff, to uh, give us your view of what was really going on. Okay. I'm going to show you the origination, satellite photos of the beginning of the storm as it was forming in the Gulf of Mexico over by Mexico City, as far west as you could possibly form. I'm going to show you the the flights that were used to track it from the National Hurricane Center and from NOAA. I'm going to show you some of their flight patterns and the data that does not support Category 3 when landfall was made. It didn't even support Category 1. Okay, so, so it's sort of a similar story to what happened with Helene. Identical. Yep, okay. Um, we've probably, a lot of you out there might have seen the footage of the inside of the uh, C-130, was it? Uh, mm-hmm. Where they, <laughs> they're being thrown around in the turbulence. I mean, that I, I kind of like to go on one of those flights. <laughs> I reckon it'd be pretty amazing. I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'd never jump out of a plane, but I, I, could, I could do that, I think. Just for the heck. Still, still, I was watching the numbers on flight radar, and up 200 feet, down 200 feet. It shows vertical velocity in addition oh, really? to speed. So it's like, woo, woo, woo. You would be feet. That's that would be like major roller coaster. It would be yes. I, I would not want to like have it. like a a hamburger and a soda first. No. <laughs> anyway. Um, let's not make light of this. I do want to also extend our very best to anyone who's been affected by this and the families um, again. But, um, you know, I guess you live in a high a high uh, risk area for hurricanes. I guess you've got to expect hurricanes, don't you? It must be probably nice the rest of the time, but um, just not when it's blowing. All right. So fill us in on what, uh, what you found with your shovel, Mr. Data. Okay. So, right off the start, there's this band of clouds right at the equator. That's called the intertropical convergence zone. And it flows from east to west. So, if you look kind of closely, you can see it's originating over in Africa. And it slowly moves across to the east. Like, you can see the motion of the clouds right off of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. This is today. This is live. And you can see these puffy looking clouds down here over northern Africa or northern South America, rather. That's a really unstable zone. As we all know, the water temperatures and the air temperatures over over the equatorial regions are, are warm. So you have a lot of convection, which is, you know, sun hits the ground, causes vertical currents, air cools as it rises, condenses and forms clouds, and then you get thunderstorms when it's a really unstable air mass like you have down there. So this is the current condition, and this is, if you look out, it persists throughout the year, and it moves north and south, 
um, mostly it goes to the southern hemisphere in the winter time for the northern hemisphere and in the summer it moves to the north so on that particular day this whole zone was farther to the north across cuba and down into the gulf of mexico so i'm going to actually show you a, a couple videos of a couple different satellite views of that day the days leading up to it so you could see right here this is the cloud top temperature um satellite photo so <laughs> when you hit the red that's super super cold minus 40 is where the cirrus clouds are the white feathery clouds and as you move to the right minus 50 is the blue minus 60 minus 70 minus 80 is the red so you could see this guy down here over Hmm, that's somewhere down by Panama. That's red topped. That's a super high, big thunderstorm. So I'm going to quickly just go through this and show you the progression right here. So this is several days before, up onto the day that it forms. I'm going to run this so you can see the spins that are induced. You can see that was a spinning area. Those are things that are trying to become tropical depressions when you see that spin. Another one right here, you can see the convection, the clouds get higher, you get colder and colder tops, and then it falls apart. And then it gets caught up in the westerly flow and moves up towards Florida. So way towards the end, that's the hurricane, right up just before you get to Mexico City, which is right there to the left. It's not far from Mexico City. That is that is uh, Milton right there. Okay. so. This is a nighttime view, which doesn't show colors, but you can see the progression right here, things moving with a bigger blow up here, moving over, and you can see they're really big and puffy, so these are a lot of convection happening. You're over really warm water, 86 degrees. You're over really warm land during the day, and these things are, each of these is huge cumulonimbus clouds. I mean, that's probably... Mm. Massive. Those are probably 20 or 30 miles across, and they're all over this area. So that intertrop it's called the intertropical convergence zone. And those things moving across are called easterly waves. So as they're moving across and they're passing over the land and getting extra heat there and over warm, moist water, these things are just popping off. So it's really unstable air, and you can keep on seeing them happening here. It's passing over land and getting really bulbous and cumuliform and cumulonimbus-like. And you can see that whole area is just a hot spot, but there's no nothing that looks like a hurricane yet, mm -hmm. which, which start, starts at a tropical depression. So I'm working my way across. And if you start looking towards Mexico City, there's a city right here called Tomiko. Mm -hmm. Tomiko, it looks like. Tomiko, it's tobacco. Gonna form, yeah, tobacco. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. Okay. As you're coming up to the fifth, right there is where it's starting to form. You can see the yellow on it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is right by Tomiko. Mexico City's just over here. And it went as far as it could. And then it sits and spins here for a while. It doesn't get going for a while. And I'm going to show you the... Um, just before... Yeah. Just while you're doing that... It, it just sort of struck me how much, I mean, again, I'm going to say it's like one of the best things that, well, happened to be Jim that said to me, shout out Jim Lee, that uh, said to me to think of, you know, the sky as a, you know, a wa water or as a river, basically fluid. Um, it's just made so much sense. And so that's what I'm looking at. I'm sort of comparing it to watching the ocean and how unstable each wave you know it's there's no ever repeated pattern really it might look like it but there's not and so out particularly in the middle of the ocean how there's you've got so many waves and then all of a sudden they'll all sort of just come together quickly and then there's this really big wave so it's like it's the same thing really isn't it well yeah watch this one watch this one in, in fast speed i'll go ahead and just put play this quickly and you can see the motions that exactly like you're saying it's like fluid it is. Mm. I mean, it's. I mean, it's, it's nothing cool. predictable about it, really, is there? It's, you can't no, it's, say it's, it's predictable-ish. Well, <laughs> Whether, ish, but yeah, on a very wide sort of frame. It, 
It's not perfect. You have five or six dueling or 10 dueling models and the forecasters have to pick the one that's the best that day. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a, it's a case of which one's doing the best and we'll stick with that until something's doing better. So that's how they mm -hmm. do it. Yep. But this, I, I now have this on a day cloud phase distinction satellite view. You'll see colors as the sun comes up. So again, you're seeing those individual things. They're big, huge, 30 miles across over land right there over the Yucatan. And right here is where it's gonna form right towards the end. And it's still not there, but this area is gonna become the hot spot. It looks like it's trying to form, nothing yet. Uh, this is right now, that's only on the first. I gotta speed this up. So here's the second day. This is like a four day, situation of what's happening so okay. it's constant fluid motion and they're trying to predict this and here we are now on the fourth and now it should be forming on the fifth right boom there we are there Meets it's up. Yeah. almost out of the water i mean it's almost out of the space to do it if it would have been nighttime mm. it might not have happened because you would not have had the extra heat from the day yeah right okay because yeah because the sun is sort of like charging a lot of this you got the moisture from the warm water yep. and then the sun warmth it's like a uh, charging it you have when you start getting that spin too you're getting the convergence of the winds and they can only go up because they can't go down and then you hit the sun and do two of them simultaneously and then if you were to push a, a trough of low pressure there over the top like we saw in australia that time on one of our videos it's that nice can affect it as well. So you have all these things interplay. Quickly, I want to show you the water temperatures over there. So 86 degrees, you need supposedly 79 degrees to make it to make a hurricane. And I've checked the temperatures across this whole Gulf of Mexico, and it's in this ver in this range. So 85, 86 Fahrenheit. Correct, Fahrenheit. Okay. I want to show you this as well because this is this really matters. Okay, this is the Earth circulation. Unless you're a flat Earth person, here's the equator. You have the easterly trades, northeasterly trades in the north hemisphere, southeasterly trades. That's why this stuff is moving east to west. So you have these converging winds. That's why they call it the intertropical convergence zone, and this is called a Hadley cell, and it's upward vertical motion at the equator. When you have both of these Hadley cells, the ver the motion is vertical because they're coming together and it's also towards the east. So that kind of explains why that's all happening, first of all. Now the question is, oh, okay. after right. that thing forms, where does it travel, where does it travel to? Mm. Here's a, a map of hurricane paths. Wow. So everybody kind of knows this they start over here as the easterly wave this is their tracks they start off of africa they work their way across in the easterlies as they're close to the equator and then they start moving to the north and then they curl back out into the to the northeast that's your typical thing so this was not atypical you're hearing about all the steering and stuff i'm this is a typical path it formed as far to the west as it could and then it swung to the northeast that's not atypical all of them do that not all helene didn't do that it went north and then went towards the low pressure over tennessee across mm -hmm. the appalachians so now i want you to show i want to show you venture sky i want to go to that date to show you the winds that day i'm going to zoom in right here where is it going to go after it forms that's the question so i'm going to put mexico city right here i actually have a bit of a question about that yep i would like to know why what stops it going on to mexico like why does it go um, and it hits mexico uh, and then it gets pushed back to the right okay so here's exactly why good question because that's exactly what i was gonna explain okay so it formed right there, mm -hmm. north of Veracruz, Mexico City's right there, somewhere in here. 
Yeah, right there. So if it had continued to the west, it would have been over land. It wouldn't even got going. Once mm. you go over land, you lose your moisture source. It would have fall, fallen apart. But on this particular day, go back to the 6th when it was still way, uh, you got to go back to the 5th. Well, that's okay. It's close enough. It's just started moving. It was where the hand is right there. Yes. It was close to shore. But I want to show you the that there is a extended zone of lower pressure. That's the spin right there of Milton. This has got a counterclockwise spin. If if we had slowed down those videos, we were seeing those spinny sections, those easterly waves falling apart, and the clouds were moving up towards um, towards Florida, and they got a whole bunch of rain those previous days from those things that fell apart. Mm -hmm. So this is a low pressure area right now. This has got a counterclockwise spin, like a low pressure center. So when you look at it from above, you have high pressure up here, which is a big high pressure ridge right here, and that's moving to the east. And you have this low pressure area here. So the ridge is coming from the west, and it's going to give a push. And the high pressure, the pressure. turns clockwise in the northern hemisphere, and low pressure turns anticlockwise in the northern Correct, hemisphere. in the northern hemisphere, yep. Opposite. But the point is, this is the weak spot. This is the push point. This is the pull point. Mm -hmm. And when you bring in the jet stream winds, I'm going to show you this 300 millibars. You have up here where it's dark maroon, that's the polar jet way up in the northern states, the United States. Down here, you have the subtropical jet. I'm going to forward whip my way through this and show you that this is going to dip down into this area. And it's already kind of close. You can see right down here, it's got the higher speed winds where 70 miles per hour. You can't move a hurricane up into that without it going to the right with the flow of that up, upward river of air. Does that make sense? Yep. It has to go where the westerlies are pulling it. You can mm -hmm. only go to the right. You can't buck the wind yeah. speeds of a jet stream. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So it's, it's being steered by the jet stream. Okay. So now that brings me, can I, can I ask a question or would you yep. like me? Yep. Okay. Uh, there's talk about um, the jet stream being controlled by them, TM. Um, is that possible? Jim Lee at Climate Viewer and I have talked about this a couple times, and he's had high-level talks with a lot of different people, and his information says no. My information is not based on talks with anybody, but you would have to alter a ridge of high pressure by making it stronger, and the only way you can do that, first of all, a ridge of high pressure is descending air, descending air warms adiabatically, and if you went back to some of our older videos on clouds and stuff like that, we talk clouds part two, we talk all about that. Descending yep. air warms, rising air cools. Mm -hmm. Warming air is something that dissipates clouds. It makes the temperature dew point go farther apart because it's you have a yeah. constant moisture. And if you have constant air temperature, uh, they might be three degrees apart and you might have a cloud. But if you warm that air, now it's seven degrees apart because the air has been descending, you're going to melt the cloud. The cloud disappears. They don't like ridges of high pressure. So it's going to, first of all, be higher pressure so the thing's going to flow away naturally. It's not going to go towards the high pressure because it's going to dissipate. But Because um, all the little ice crystals are going to melt and everything. Correct. Yeah? You're going to right. increase the temperature dew point spread. And once well, that happens, pepper. you can't have a cloud. It turns into vapor again. Mm -hmm. So increasing a ridge of high pressure strength would require chemicals, massive dumps of that, to actually heat the atmosphere. They, yeah. they can say all they want, but, you know, I would love to see. I did see that one interview with David Miles that Jim did. Mm -hmm. He seems like a real smart guy, and he says he can do that. He says he can change jet streams, but um, Jim told me that he didn't provide proof, and supposedly he makes money doing that. 
So I don't know. It's it doesn't seem impossible, but it seems like a really big task to me. How do you? Would, yeah, yeah. It just seems like it would take a lot of resources and everything. And it's sort of like you've also got to do the cost benefit analysis thing. It's like, well, uh, there's maybe easier ways to do a land grab or steal an election. You know what I mean? It's like, do they really have to go to all this trouble? Um, seems what's, like what's the benefit of it, really? I mean, is yeah. it just purely to be able to control stuff if that's the case? But um, I mean, like. Does, does this look all fairly normal to you? I mean, like this is what the Earth's been doing for donkey's years, right? <laughs> well, just think about the complexity of that. You Depending saw all those donkey is. You look at look at the complexity of all that. How would you track that or f affect that easterly wave to even f form a hurricane at the farthest possible reach to the west? And how would you affect that ridge? to give it the push back to the east, the ridge to the west? And how would you affect that low pressure area over Florida that provided the suck to bring it from the west towards the Florida coast? You're talking huge macro scale areas. How do you affect all that? Mm. Well, I guess some people sort of say, oh, they can do it from satellites with lasers and plasma and oh, blah, blah, cool. blah, blah. <laughs> it would be an incredibly complex very highly require a lot of energy or something. How many nuclear power plants would that take to provide that power to focus it on those humongous areas? It seems ridiculous to me. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to just raise the thought that, you know, not many people seem to have talked about, and that's like nature's pretty powerful without us having to help her along. And um, it just reminds me of when, when the coof came along, you know, 2020. <laughs> um and the flu disappeared. <laughs> it's sort of like, well, this, you know, this a sudden awareness of people just sort of going, well, they they are doing it and they're steering and Nick's red and blah blah blah. It's like, what? Are, where's nature in all this? Is she sort of on the unemployment list now or what? And uh, we know they've tried to do the hurricane steering and all that. Jim Jim Lee has gone into that a number of times in his Climate Viewer show, but. Um, it doesn't seem like they've had a lot of success with, well, it seems like it would be a heck of a coincidence to have all these natural atmospheric looking type scenarios matching up exactly with what's being proposed as being steered or artificially done. Because it's like, well, that's a coincidence because nature happens to be doing exactly what would produce this anyway. Unless they're, unless they're controlling the whole jet stream, the whole of, I mean, that would be an immense incredibly huge project they can't manage the budget how can they manage the weather <laughs> well maybe that's where the budget's going <laughs> who knows um anyway let's continue okay so i want to go to the point now where w we established why it moved the way it did so at that point after helene i learned about National Hurricane Center and I decided to go and really use them when Milton came up, right? So I found out they did aircraft reconnaissance flights. So from this point on, which was when they first said this thing formed, which was Saturday, October 5th, that morning, central daylight time, which had been, you know, 12, 13, 14 Zulu London time. Mm -hmm. um, this is when it officially formed and they start putting out all these updates and this was called Tropical Depression 14 at that time so from there I went and went to um, what do you call it uh, flight radar and flight radar 24 with the intent of looking for aircraft flying into that and of course, right off the start, I knew from going to their hurricane center that they were doing the C-130 flights, mm -hmm. that they were doing the P-3 flights out of Lakeland, that they were doing the Gulf Stream flights at 45,000 feet from their schedule that they produced. And I, we covered that stuff pretty well in that last video. Yes. But I wanted to track that those, those numbers all the way across 
and compare them to the updates that were being put out by the uh, people at the National Hurricane Center. So it tracked really well. I mean, there was pretty good correlation. Their, their forecast always said a little bit higher than what they saw from the aircraft. And mm -hmm. I don't want to get too deeply into the aircraft data. Uh, I won't probably get into it at all. We did that ad nauseum last show. Yes. On the so first very devoted one. to got to the end of that show. <laughs> yeah. The, only the numbers geeks made it through. <laughs> but done. what I wanted to do to this time was focus on all of the aircraft that were out there. And you can see right here, this is a pretty busy area. These, this traffic did not alter much at all when it was a tropical depression. It didn't turn right. into a hurricane until it was somewhere out here and the traffic did get altered. So if I went to playback mode you, and, I, and if I just said, I have all these filters set up just to show yeah. you how I That's checked set up this. That's October 12th. Right. Oh, okay. You're just showing us the filters, right? Yeah. Just showing you how I'm filtering these things. So these okay. grayed out ones are all of the commercial aircraft. UAL, United Airlines, Africa, I don't know what AFR is, but these are all commercial flights. Like that one is Valeris, never heard of it. Viv, Vivo Aerobus. These are commercial flights on the jet routes. So I was looking for something that would be dropping something into that storm, like with black carbon or something like that, like Jim showed on um his most recent video, which was this past weekend, I think. Yeah, like he, Operation Storm Fury and all that. Right. And he showed a line of cargo aircraft like C-130s at 50,000 feet, dropping black carbon to change the hurricane in the way that they wanted to do it. Well, I spent four hours yesterday going over five days from the first on and I looked at anything that went into that flight, into that location. So I was having to check the location by, um, here, the, here's the problem. When you take it out of playback mode, you see the clouds. You put it in playback, you lose the clouds. So I can't have history yeah. of the clouds. So you have to constantly verify back and forth between satellite photos and it, right? Right. Uh, between yes. the flight radar. So, just to show you how I could find the location, I tracked all those military flights that were on the schedule and I actually saw them. And the first one was the sixth at 1300, I said. So, Teal 71 shows up. Right here. Yeah, the P3 came in first. And then at 1800, Teal 71, the C-130 came in. Okay, and now hang on a minute. The, the P3, is that the one that's lower, like so only up to about 15,000 feet? Or? No, that one was a little bit lower, like 2,000 meters. In this case, i got to back up to see it. but Yeah, but the P3 wanna... is the one that they send in, Just uh, that's the lower one, and then the C-130 yeah, the is P3's, the one that goes up much higher. Yes, yes. Yeah. But right here, they were at uh, altitude 10,000. So they've been lower in the past, but the in line. this case, they they were at 10,000. That was the first assessment right there. And one, two, three, four. I have all these things listed with the times. And I to save time on this, just to show you, I'll pick one more that had a double. Seventh at 11Z. This is interesting in that it formed a very strange pattern that people talked about on the internet. Uh, was that the big C? The big C. <laughs> C for clown world. <laughs> right here. So if, if a tornado wasn't, I mean, a hurricane wasn't round, it probably wouldn't have been a C. Would that be a fair assessment? <laughs> if, if, if a hurricane right. was triangular, it probably would have been more like an A shape. That'd be right. Yep. <laughs> Is that where we're heading here? So you could see the shape of that thing. It went on the per outer perimeter of it out here. Mm -hmm. And then it went 
closer to the eye much tighter. And I found that this was NOAA 49's, the Gulf Streams, method on multiple occasions. Multiple hurricanes in the past, do you mean? Or multiple, multiple occasions, occasions for on this, this one? This one, on okay. this one. So here's the second time they did it as you're getting closer to Yucatan. And then there's a third right, one. So, so they're taking the readings from the outer wind speeds and then they're going in and taking the tighter in towards the eye wind speeds. Is that what's happening yeah. here? They're flying okay. right through it. Each of these guys is flying right through that thing, crisscrossing in multiple occasions. Like this is 42. This is the picture showing 49 because that's what I have highlighted. I clicked on right. that aircraft on. Yep. showing its path. But 42, the P3 was also there going through it as it was passing close to the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. And all that data was streaming back and we covered those codes and everything in the previous episode. So I won't go there today, but you could just see if you took, I took screenshots of all these, basically where they are. And there were two aircraft here and that was the C-130, Teal-71 and NOAA-42 was a P-3 and they were probably at different levels, a couple thousand feet different. But the point is, the, I was focusing on the main data source that we had, which was these aircraft because there's no observation stations out there, no weather stations. And I followed it all the way across and what they were putting out on their, on their forecasts, on their uh, follow-up forecast to each of these flights was pretty good. So as you get all the way across, to finally okay, get hang there. On. Before yeah. you go on, let's just verify. So you were just saying when when you're saying what they put out on their forecast, are you talking about they as in the weather people, like the weather? Yes, National Hurricane Center. Yes. The National Hurricane Center. Okay, right. so that's where the like Na National Weather Service gets its information? Correct. They were getting from these aircraft. That was their main uh, gather d data gathering point for this. Right. So that's how everybody gets their information. Yep. Correct. So it correlates with what was coming directly off the planes that you looked at in all that black and white data. And yes. it was the same as what was being put out publicly, correct? Correct. Okay. So to verify that. if you looked at these discussions, they put them out like every, I mean, fairly often, every few hours. These are the ones that all the weather... All the analysts, the satellite analysts, they're telling you what's happened based on that flight. Satellite yep. imagery this morning suggests that it's getting better organized with the central dense overcast getting larger and some outer bending. I mean, they get really detailed with this yep. and the speeds. And then they talk about um, a lot of the times they give uh, wind speeds in here and category possibilities range from category one. I mean, it gets really detailed, but we don't need to go that deep into the weeds no, right here. Sorry. The point was we were focusing on what they said to see if not only the end result, but um, the end route stuff matched what they were saying. I was just trying to see if the fear porn was originating with them, with yeah. the National Hurricane Center, which is what it looked like on Helene. Mm. But not here. But in this case, I didn't know. So I delve deeply into that uh, source and tracking it the whole way and it sure seemed good but I don't think it turned out good because I mean it came out good for people but they were calling for category three and this is where we come to when it gets to landfall the obser observations so if I go to this I can pick a state and pick any station uh, Florida yeah. in this case, and I can then click on, let's say that one's Perry, which is where the, uh, these are all the observation stations that you get the data from. Yep. Okay. It gives all the wind speeds and stuff like that. So this is from this yep. location right here. So, okay. Um, I'm showing you the data for the one that had the highest peak gust. 
So this was, was called, this prior uh, to landfall. Yeah. Or? Well, this is at landfall. So okay. it's these are showing the winds for from the time zero zero fifty three until fourteen fifty three, Zulu. So that's okay. landfall is. You could see if you track these winds, where it's a steady wind is right here, northwest at sixteen. That's at the end of the period. That's it was knots. Out of the is north, that sixteen knots? Knots, correct. So okay. at the very beginning, I have fifty-three, forty-five, forty-nine, forty-two, forty-one, forty-six, and it continually starts dropping down. So you had a peak gust of eighty-eight knots. 64 to 82 sustained is category one. This station, which had the highest gust 88. of all these stations that I found, was 88. So it was have, slightly over category one. Mm, no, that's gust. Oh, that's, that's a gust. gust. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Defined by? A, a burst of wind, just a really quick increase. Yeah. It's not not quite a minute or something. Was that? No, right? it's just instantaneous. What, just what quick, yeah. peak wind is what they're showing here in the remarks. Peak wind. 81, okay. 76, 76. Yeah. So that that system, one of those eye walls passed through here with an 81 and an 88 and an 88. And of that entire place right there, this this is Kimsey, so Kissimmee. Um, Kissimmee. Um, <laughs> oh no, darling, we'll have to have dinner first. <laughs> my my notes here are about the wind speeds for each of these places. So here was the eighty one max, and this is KTPA, which is I I believe this is uh, the big airport there, Tampa, and. That was 81 gust, 47 sustained. When you go through all this stuff, you don't find, even in the 50s sustained uh, after all these places, 43, 45, 47, 44, 42, 42. These are the numbers we were seeing. 42 is tropical storm strength. Those gusts don't go into that Saphir Simpson scale. Here's a 69. That's the highest here. And if you go to the peak wind remarks, 62, 60s, 70, you don't see anything that supports. This is one, two, three, four. There's 10 stations picked right around the Tampa Bay area that I used. Okay. So what you're saying is that it didn't get anywhere near a category three. Is that what you're confirming here? I'm saying it was tropical storm strength. You might have had isolated winds along the coast over the water before it hit land where people were. Yeah. So out over the water, certainly a 60 knot wind out of the same direction for a long time is going to give you humongous waves, humongous storm surge. That caused a lot of damage. I mean, yeah, I that saw was the main a thing, wasn't videos. It? The storm surge was tremendous. Yep. But they're calling for Category 3, which go back to the scale again. Category 3 says sustained 96 to 112. We didn't have a gust to that in knots. Yeah, there wasn't even a flash of over 96 once it hit as it was coming to land. And as further evidence, I want to show you this too. Okay, so in these discussions that I, t I showed you earlier, so they're highlighting the highest, 69 miles per hour, 86, 74. My comment is two of these three get into cat one for a gust. Sustained miles per hour, 74 to 95. 74. Category one. That's at the minimum category one. That's a category one. That's a category tropical storm. Tropical storm, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it, it wasn't anywhere near a Category 3 as it hit landfall, as we were being told. So we've verified that. Yep, and this on multiple multiple of these, they do the same thing. They're highlighting the best. Yep, all right. 
So we've gone over all that data now. What we're saying is that the National Hurricane Centre information did correlate with the uh, reconnaissance data. Yes. But what didn't correlate was the mainstream media. Is that correct? Well, is that the moral got, of the story? No, they were still putting out the forecast for Category 3 at landfall. So the National but, Hurricane Centre was? Correct. Okay, all right. So you can't argue with somebody wanting to do clickbait and fear porn, but they're they're not doing that because they think it's right. I should. So the the inf the incorrect information was coming from the National Hurricane Center regarding that's, the Category Three. That's what I see. I mean, even after it came on land, it, they're saying it was Category Three. That's not what the data from each station is stating. Right. All right. Well, I think we've shown that. What can we say? I mean, like, <laughs> if all these people are getting their information from what's meant to be the, you know, the Bible of <laughs> weather data not correlating properly, I mean, where do you go from that? You know, where do you, what do you do with that? <laughs> Seems to me that I was a weather forecaster, so I just don't know where that disconnect is why why that happened i i don't get that well i mean two times um, in a row two times in a row i'm going to speak it out loud is it possible that it's being uh, manipulated to support a certain climate narrative perhaps perhaps that's one option we can't think of any others though can you <laughs> no that one that mm. one fits the most the most because we know how that's being pushed on us Yes. Okay. Well, the fear porn in the atmosphere. The atmosphere, F E A R. That's correct. All right. Well, um, I guess that looks like it might be it for this hurricane season. We hope. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's typically the end right now, but um, I haven't looked forward because been delved into the depths yeah. of this one here so in looking back i will open my eyes again tomorrow and take a look and i don't think there's anything you can usually just look at venture sky and it'll show the ones that are out there so this is present day forecast shows this so leslie they have a 94l there's a name to it out there it's just off of africa where it's formed and it's tracking to the east like it should hurricane leslie but uh, Hurricane Leslie is moving up into f towards France or towards Spain. Okay. I believe so, there was some some geoengineering or some testing or something going on out there. The I, think, I believe it was the Germans and the French, right in that spot actually, uh, around about when Her Helene was happening. But um, it's I sort of got the impression I didn't read a whole lot about that, but I got the impression they it's like oh yeah we do this all the time. So I don't know. Didn't look into that bit. But I don't think that had anything to do with anything. It's just that that's what they do. I mean, you look at a map on, like, for instance, um, uh, climateviewer.org. If you go there, uh, there's a very cool toy where you can look. Oh, it's not a toy, actually. It's a very sophisticated piece of software um, that Jim Lee has put together, and it, you can put all sorts of different filters on it, show um, all the uh, weather globally, geoengineering projects that are going on, um, locations of all the harp places all this stuff i mean it's just endless um people can go there and have a look at all the things and see where they are all around the world jim's done a show or two on it and you can see where all these places are and they don't sort of try to hide them in that sense i think we can conclude i don't know i mean looking at that uh the jet stream that would take an immense incredible amount of engineering to be able to control something like that so i mean look at the size of it <laughs> it's ridiculous yep. that's that's a band of 50 mile per hour wide winds or more so if you look at here's how you locate the polar jet you go to the temperature scale go to 500 millibars and the purple right on that junction of purple to 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 light or purple to dark blue that's where your polar jet is mm -hmm. So in order to influence that low over the Aleutians, you would have to 
increase the strength of this ridge so that would either fall apart or slide up over it. You're talking a thousand miles. Yeah, I know. Where it you'd just have seems to a little bit add that heat specific to a specific region in the center of the atmosphere mm. to increase the strength of that ridge. And to add that sort of heat would um I mean, who knows? So if we can read about it on the internet, then it's probably not stuff that they're doing. <laughs> Basically, that's the way I look at it. If we can find info about it, it's 99% sure that it's probably stuff they've done in the past or, um, you know, have thought about or proposing or what have you, like a lot of the patents. Anyway, it's all speculation. There's not much point in talking about all this because really unless somebody can bring something a little bit more solid, um, including the fellow that Jim was talking to. What's his Show name? David. the money. Show me the money. Yeah, yeah, bring us. <laughs> Bring us the receipts and we'll talk about it. Anyway, uh, I think we've probably delved into that enough. And um, thank you, everybody, who's still here <laughs> at this point. Um, just trying to show you that there are ways that you can check all this stuff yourself. You don't have to be a slave to what you're hearing online, on Facebook or YouTube or mainstream media or any of those kinds of places. There's, you know, it's a heck of a lot of misinformation around sort of based on things that people just <laughs> simply don't understand. Um, so, you know, the only way to get around some of the misinformation really is to is education. Once you're educated, you can sort of argue about certain things to a point. Um, and it's a process of elimination as well. It's about stripping away the bovine excrement. <laughs> and hopefully you'll find a little bit of truth there in the middle of a big fat cow patty amongst all those cow farts that are killing the planet. Anyway, thank you very much for slaving over a hot radar for us, Jeff. Appreciate that again. It was fun. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who's uh, given us comments and remarks of support, etc. And, um, oh, even to the shills. Thanks. <laughs> you make us stronger. <laughs> and uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to forward them to weather at stellaq.com.au. Don't forget the AU. And we'll do our best to um, look into something for you, maybe do a show about it. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for listening. Stay safe out there and be true. Be true.